Welcome to GreyPrimer.com. My name is Nick. I'm your host, and on today's episode, we're going to look at my travel kit for hobbying on the move. So just to clarify, that's not actually hobbying while moving, because I guess there'd be a market for that. A hobby while on a train or on a bus or passenger, definitely a passenger, not a driver, in a car. There's probably scope, but that's not what this is about. This is about the problem of having all of this paint and more paint and spray paint and paint brushes and hobby tools and the miniatures into something that you can actually carry around with you without, you know, sort of needing a trolley. Because there's a problem in this hobby with being addicted to gathering stuff. I say I say problem in the Liz's possible sense. I get a lot of enjoyment out of sort of shopping for paints and brushes and clippers and, you know, lighting systems and, you know, magnifiers. There's no shame in it. Um, there's procrastination in it. You know, if you think that the essence of the hobby is to get miniatures and build them and then paint them, there's definitely a procrastination sort of phase here in the hobby where you're doing everything but those things. You're doing everything but building and painting. So for me, perhaps, that was the first sort of six to 12 months of the hobby. And I tended to get distracted very easily. I, I go watch a YouTube video about the best brushes or the best clippers. or And then I kind of got to a point in the hobby where I'd found the best clippers for me, the brush that worked best for me, the glue that I liked the most. And then when I started to think about going to like a, uh, you know, a, a gaming convention or to over to a friend's house, or even if I was on a work thing uh, and I wanted maybe to do a bit of hobbying in the evening in the hotel room, I needed to sort of get to get some kind of a, a box to put that stuff in. To, to carry those essentials. And really, that's what we're going to look at today. How I managed to pare all of this down into the just the very basics that I need without sacrificing the core components of what I love to use when I hobby, what I love to use when I paint. And also to make it so that the miniatures I bring with me are transported safely. I really wanted to get sort of a, a, a travel kit that I could fit into a backpack that even left space in the backpack for maybe a laptop at the back or, you know, notepads, tablets, whatever else I needed to bring with me, including like snacks or, you know, jumper or something like that. And I didn't need it to have wheels in the bottom of it, you know, just a regular backpack. So that's what we're going to look at now. Uh, have a look at the, the different components that make up the travel kit and how the I've managed not to sacrifice my favorite tools and equipment just because I'm hobbying on the go. Back soon. So what you can see in front of you here are all of the components of my core travel kit. I've modified this so that it can be switched between different types of or different parts of the hobby. So I can have it dedicated to painting or dedicated to, to hobbying or do a mix of both. And that's what I'm going to show this layout today inside. This this is going to be the, the bit of both. Let's go through the, the different components. Um, hydration. Always, always stay hydrated. This is just a regular old metal water bottle. Uh, this was the UK Games Expo 2019 water bottle. Now... As a little feedback, it is really losing its yellow fast. You can see how easy it is to scrape off, but you should not be able to take off the, the stuff so easily with your fingernail. This has sustained most damage from just being in my bag, but you can see there just by a quick scrape how, how quickly it, it loses its, its uh, coating. Um, apart from that, it's, it's fine. Now, this is one I got from work. A work conference in 2016, it does not scrape away. Doesn't matter how hard you try, that does not scrape away. Um, and that is coming up on four years old. So, just feedback for UK Games Expo. 
whoever did this coding for you, this printing, um, I think they're missing part of the process. Maybe a, a finishing step or something or whatever it is. I, I don't know. Needs looked at anyway. Um, the other main component here that's not in a box are these uh, magnifying illuminated glasses. Uh, these are a... <laughs> they're not a lifesaver. They're, they're a time saver. They're a frustration saver. They give you a better appreciation of the the detail that's in minis. Um, and if you're doing really fine detail paint work or finishing, then these can get you really in there. You know, you can really get, get for, for things like eyeballs or, or for, you know, um, freehand painting or something like that. Uh, this is, is going to be a massive help to you. Uh, they are totally flexible at the front there. So, you know, you can be wearing them like this and be able to see someone normally. And then when you get back to work, you flip that all down and you see sort of a magnified. This is part of a set that comes with it. These ones I think are three X. So we can get that to focus. Here we see 3.5. So those are 3.5 X. And they come in a little box with a whole bunch of different uh, magnifications, different strengths. Uh, this is the strongest, so it's the one. That's what I think it's the one that's been on it the entire time. I don't think the others have ever come out of their box. And you have this flexible light up here, which gives uh, a bluish LED. Um, there's two bulbs there. Yeah, two little bulbs. You can see it switched off. So quite a bluish LED. You wouldn't want to be using that to, to judge um, the trueness of color in your painting because uh, it is going to be have a blue uh, hue to it. Torch is powered by I think three batteries. Let me just check. Yeah, three AAA batteries on the inside there, uh, which add a significant amount of weight to the front of the, the headset. So if you are putting these on without the batteries, then pop three batteries in. It feels like somebody is just sort of leaning on your head. They are that heavy. Uh, I always use it with the batteries, so I don't know any different. Um, but yeah, you can definitely feel it, especially on the bridge of your nose here, with these sort of flexible, rubberized metal sort of um, nose guards, whatever, whatever they're called. Uh, they're not the most comfortable thing in the world, especially when this is heavy with the batteries. But still, it's worth the pain. The pain that I really get from this that's not worth it is the pinch I get at the side of my head here with these uh, supports. This really causes me pain. And it actually dents my head. You know, I can sort of feel at the sides of my head after uh, a little while wearing these. Um, the indentations that they cause, they are just too snug for me. Um, and if there's a version of these that has a slightly wider arm like that or something, I'd probably buy three of them. So, let's get into the core. Let's move the bento box out of the way slightly and have a look at the big fella here. Uh, this is from Table... not Tabletop Minions, that's going to be in my head now the whole time. Tabletop Tyrant. Make these. Whole bunch of different sizes, layouts, variants. Uh, and well worth checking out. When it first arrived, I was like, oh god, it's a cardboard box. I've just spent, you know, whatever it was, plus shipping on a cardboard box. This is just so silly. But it's not. It's really solidly made. Um, whatever, double layer cardboard throughout. Really good quality sectioned off foam inside. They they do all different sort of sizes for different types of minis. I think they do pick and pluck as well, so you can design it whatever way you want. The combination of the quality cardboard, the, the amazing little carrying handle here, which is a brilliant addition, the high quality um, foam inside. I've never lost anything using this. I've never had a, a mini damaged even. Uh, it just seems to work. So, as you can see, I have made this my depository for the many stickers that uh, get passed to me or that I accumulate. 
Um, and I love, you know, <laughs> I love that when this is sitting on the on the desk in front of me it, at a convention or something or in a game store, there's sort of the person will engage you first and foremost, and sort of say, "Listen, hey." Hi, who are you? You know, what are you working on? And you'd be like, oh, I'm Nick. I'm working on this and this. And then you realize you've lost their attention within seconds because they're looking at the stickers. And that's that. You know, there's no point in you talking anymore. You might as well just go through the stickers with them because that's what they're, they're looking at. Um, so I'm going to go through the stickers with you really quickly. Uh, Farmer Sakar is a great game shop in Copenhagen. Uh, two stories. What was on the ground floor, I think, was board games, uh, and expansions and things like that. Maybe card games as well. Some dice. Lots, I say some dice, but there are thousands of dice. Uh, and then upstairs were minis, um, basing materials, hobby materials, stuff like that. Great shop, actually. Well, well worth the visit. Uh, we've got, uh, Spiky Bits, little sticker there. Raphael, my favorite brushes in the world. Tabletop Minions, um, and a few various things. My local game store in Dublin, Gamers World. Well worth the trip in if you're in Dublin. Um, Dublin Gaming, just slightly hidden by my own branding there. Uh, Weird Games, Game 4, great app. Uh, if you are in traveling to a city, that you haven't been to before, or if you're trying to explore maybe the territory you're you're currently in, looking for gaming groups, looking for conventions that are on, I always use it for um, finding out what game shops exist in cities I've never been to before. So I was able, like for Copenhagen, for example, and I was able just to pop Copenhagen into it. I gave it like a 50 kilometer radius, uh, told me all the game stores that were there. As the app grows, as Game 4 grows, it'll have more of these sort of, what was the, what's the term they use? Verified? Yeah, so I think a, a storm, a storm, uh, a gaming shop needs to be verified and it gets a different tag or it gets clickable links or I'm not sure. Go on to Game 4, check it out yourself. It'll be in your app store. But yeah, when I've traveled to cities like Amsterdam or Copenhagen or Malmo or Ottawa, Montreal, different places like that where you're just like, I have no idea what exists here. Game 4 has the list of all the shops. Absolutely brilliant. Lifesaver. It's not a lifesaver. Then we've got other things. This is, speaking of local game shops, this is over in Galway. Uh, Dungeons and Donuts. They just recently moved into new premises, so I wish them all the very best. Great store. Um, nice bunch of people there as well. Uh, Fandom, I think, is in Ottawa. Um, a great little Irish punk band there. The Loft is in Ottawa. Um, it's one of these cool board game cafes. A little shout out to the Belfast Giants ice hockey team. Um, in my well, near to my hometown. And speaking of in my home county, uh, and also in my home county on tabletop um, from County Antrim in Northern Ireland, huge shout out to the, those guys there. Uh, when I when I came back into the hobby, I was just so pleased to see a local, you know, outfit who were dedicated to the hobby. I, I just thought it was brilliant because, you know, when you first come back in, or you first start to get interested in it. There are huge sort of organizations like Dice Tower, and Dice Tower do amazing things, have a really good um, attitude towards gaming, very family-friendly content and everything, and, and are really dedicated to, to the to the hobby. But they seem so far away. They seem, you know, they're over in Florida, and when you then find out there's this one in County Antrim, it's like, and has a, there's a shop there in Rain that you could just, walk into and you don't know who you're going to see in there from the channel. Just magic. Magic to find that out. So that's that's the stickers. And that's the end of the video. Now we've gone through the stickers. I'm just kidding. So let's have a look inside. Uh, to access it, you just push the handle down, freeze up that space. And in here, you've got more stickers, obviously. Um, up top, I have this. This came 
a little fold-out game mat from the Scorn Battle Box from Privateer Press. That's the Hordes game that they have. But it came with this, which is a laminated play mat. And I have actually found this to be the perfect work surface for taking to conventions and game shops and to friends' houses. It just is a great way to protect the work surface. So if you're at one of these hotel, you know, convention, hotel-based conventions, they always seem to have those big white sheets over their tables, you know, the, the big tablecloths, and you're like, oh, I, I really don't want to spill something on this. I don't want to spill null oil on this or um, even super glue or something, because you know it's going to get wrecked. You know that, yeah, they, they've seen their fair share of spilled coffee and tomato soup and red wine, but they have not yet experienced, um, like, something like, let me see, what would be really nasty? Oh, yeah. This, something like AK's enamel track wash. That is not going to wash out of one of their white sheets. And super glue is just, it's, it's on there to stay. You're always going to have that crusty little corner of something, uh, for the, for the rest of that tablecloth's life. So something like this, slightly laminated. Um, again, this was with the privateer press hordes, scorn battle group. It's something that when I do go to conventions, I always contact them beforehand just to say, Hey, is it okay if I hunker down in a corner somewhere and paint all day or hobby all day? I will protect the surface that I'm working on um, and make sure that everything is kept nice and tidy. And that I've never had one of them come back to me and say, no, you can't paint here. You can't hobby here because you're going to make a mess because I've preempted that by saying I'm going to protect the surface or whatever. So what you have at the top here? And this is the tabletop tyrant box. It is a skinny layer of foam. Um, just goes over the top like that. It kind of acts like a little lid inside. And then you're into the first of the sort of 16 aperture main layers. So as you can see here, it's got Blood Bowl Elves inside it. These are on 25 mil bases, but you can see there's enough space there to fit um, probably a 32 mil base very comfortably. I don't think you'd fit a 40 mil base there, but let me just see. Yeah, 40 mil would be stretching it. It just it just wouldn't go in there comfortably, uh, but I have in the past laid them over like that, um, and they seem to be fine. Again, never lost a mini to it. Never suffered any damage while it's been in there. So no bother at all. So 16 per layer. Uh, so this is a almost finished Blood Bowl Elf team and they will, they went in there no bother. Um, and it just means I can take that to convention and work away on that. And then we go into the next layer. Another one of these skinny boys. So here we have the second layer. Again, 16 spaces here. You can see it's sort of underneath these paint pots. You know, you can have that whatever way you want it. I found that this is perfect for sort of each one of these. You can fit sort of two of these across, two of these dropper bottles, or one of the larger um, Citadel Technical. Is that what their range is called? Texture. Texture or technical. Um, larger pots just fits nicely in there. Uh, even sort of the, the super glue here with the um, skinny applicator uh, fits nicely in there too. And this all sits very comfortably underneath that, that top layer of minis. Uh, they look a bit sort of higgledy-piggledy here, but once you sort of get that layer onto them, everything sort of settles nicely down. Um, but very, very cool. And then we've just got sort of, sort of a, a range of different colors here. Uh, a few metallics, uh, texture paint there, the Typhus Corrosion, which is an amazing paint. This is an interesting one. I have a bunch of these Citadel paints from 89. This is Sunburst Yellow. I've got 
all the inks and everything from back then. There were a few that when I sort of peeled back the lids on the, the old t- t- style pots, they were a bit sort of crusty looking, a bit, you know, some of them were, were bone dry inside. And, you know, there was nothing more for those than to throw them in the bin. But a lot of these have actually, I mean, if you think of, you know, 89, it's over 30 years old now. And it's still going. That's just incredible. Whoever made those back in the day for Citadel, or maybe they made them themselves, but it is just phenomenal, the the quality of that paint. Uh, and I'm blown away. And then there's this great Citadel plastic glue um, with the skinny applicator. Now, normally I would use, or traditionally, I would use one of the um, Tamiya or Tamiya plastic cements, these guys here, uh, the standard one, and then the extra thin, because they have a very, very handy, just, let me see it in there. Not really. Brush applicator. Yeah, you can see it sort of stick in there in the middle of that one. Um, and the encouraging huge red poison sign on the side of it. That's definitely something you want to be just having sitting open on your desk. And that was the problem. I was sitting having that open beside me while I was doing a lot of work, maybe doing, you know, going through a box of 20 or 30 minis and gluing them in sort of the production line way that I do. I was getting monumental headaches and dizziness because that is not good for you having that in your system. Something that's marked in red as poison. Yeah, probably not great to have that right beside your face without some kind of ventilation or a protection mask or something. So I moved over to using super glues. And it was at that point that I realized that I was, as the super glue dries, it leaves like a sort of a crusty coat around some of the sort of arm joints and things like that. And it just wasn't the finish, as, as clean a finish as I normally like. So I was in Mark's Models, which is another great hobby shop in Dublin. I sort of said the problem I'd been having with um, the uh, plastic cement. And then I said I, uh, I'd switched over to super glue, but I just wasn't happy with it. And they had said, well, just use one of the little ones with the metal applicator. You're getting exposed to a lot less vapor that way. And if you tip it over on your desk, it's not going to, you know, spill stinky glue all over the place. And I was like, it's just genius. And as he tried to sell me one, I realized I had the Citadel one sitting in the house. And I think it actually came with that Conquest magazine as well. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that was part of the subscription offer in the early days of it. Anyway, went home, tried out that applicator one, and that's all I've used ever since. Fantastic. I don't get any headaches anymore, so highly recommend it. Uh, and other brands do it as well, so you don't have to just stick with the Citadel one. That's that main box out of the way. And again, that was manufactured or made by um, Tabletop. Tyrant. Not Tabletop Minions. Tabletop Tyrant do that. So let's get into the bento box here now. This is a Japanese style of uh, lunch box. Um, really cool. Come in all different sort of shapes and sizes and different materials. While this is a bamboo effect top on it, it it's all plastic. This is a two compartment, two main compartment uh, bento box with an actual hidden, hidden um, third compartment up here, which is much shallower. Each of those main compartments is waterproofed, sealed with a silicon ring. And that was what brought me to this, um, because I'd been heading off to a convention. I think it was in 2018. I had wanted to bring my wet palette with me, which is normally fine. But on this particular occasion, I think it was something like a, a snack bar was sitting on top of the wet palette in my bag, where it had slipped in front of it. And the pressure of the bag had pushed the snack bar into the lid, and it created a very small buckle at the bottom of the lid. And that was a just enough space for all of the water in the wet palette, which had been fairly stable within its sponge. It decided, no, I'll just... 
go out the bottom here and have an explore around this, this person's bag. So I arrived at the convention. The base of my backpack was dripping wet. And it was just a, a, a huge mess. Um, and I swear at that point I'd come up with a much better solution. So this bento box does not buckle. It's really solid. These two main layers have the silicon seals in them. They have a little pressure valve on them as well, which I'll show you when we open it up. Uh, and has been perfect. Ever, ever since I started using it, it's been perfect. Uh, these boxes are available at all sorts of homeware places or Amazon or, you know, wherever else you, you would shop. Um, for lunch boxes, you're going to find a version of this somewhere. Uh, I like the elastic band, keeps everything in place. And as you can see from it, it's solidly built. There's, there's no flexing or anything. Looks like a hobby knife. To had a go at getting in here. That's quite a, a deep groove on it. Let's take off this elastic band. Uh, and this came with it, just like a stretchy band. It's great. Then we have our two main sections. And this one here, so here you can see sort of the, the little plug. And you pop that out to release the pressure inside. And then you can relatively easily get the lid off. Because of the silicon ring, it can offer a little bit of resistance. But as you can see in there, I have a wet palette. And you can just about see some moisture drops on the top there. Uh, but that is just actually a cleaning cloth, like a, a cleaning sponge for cleaning around your home. Cut the fit. And then on top of that, uh, you would put a piece of um, parchment paper. Um, and that's it. Super easy wet palette. Well, I've learned over time to not travel with it with paint on the actual paper because uh, it'll just end up as a streaky, smeary mess. When I'm heading off to the con in the morning, I get it to where I want it to be with the, the, the level of water in the sponge. I get my uh, parchment paper down and smooth because they have a tendency to, to wrinkle and bubble. So that sometimes needs you to sort of settle it down. And then you'll see it start to curl at the edges. And at that point, just flip it over to the other side and then smooth it down again. It'll take a little while just to get it just right. But once it's in there, it's ready for the day. And then before I leave the con, I will sort of roll up that piece of paper with all the little blobs of paint on it and just throw it into the bin. The Then we have our, our top compartment here. And then this lid just comes off. And we can see inside are the main tools. It's actually incredibly useful having this layer here because you can just fit so much stuff into it. And it's, it's amazing what will actually go into this. You can fit all this stuff. So I've got in here, got my main hobby knife. We've got a drill, a drill bit my little modeling tool for when I'm doing filling in gaps in, in molds uh, that really sort of helps me push in the, the modeling putty and stuff or green stuff or whatever I'm using. My main paint brushes which are currently I think two sizes of Raphael 8404s. They're, you can tell those by the sort of orange backs on them. Um, that's a zero and a two zero. Get an idea of sort of their size there. The zero is quite a big one, and that would be one of my main brushes. And then the two zero is very handy for uh, details. What else have we got here? A Vallejo dry brush, I think. With a really tight lid on it. Yeah, there's the Vallejo dry brush. I'm not sure what that's made of. It says Torre or something on the side. I think that came free with something. I think I bought a, a bunch of um, game color in one of those, those big multi boxes. I think there's like 150 paints or something in it. And you got some brushes free with it. That was one of them. But it's, it's handy as a dry brush. And then the last one is sort of a big, much bigger bristled brush um, with a huge sort of paint reserve on it there. And this would be a number two from Windsor & Newton. 
Um, and that gives you an idea of the three main brush sizes I will bring with me. There you go. So the number and two from Windsor Newton, and then the zero from Raphael, and the two zero there. And that pretty much covers everything that I need with the dry brush. Uh, also in here we have a little flat emery board, flat file, uh, one of the, the metal, sort of this is in a triangular shape, just about to see it there. Uh, these come in kits with many different shapes and sizes, but I find that the triangular one to be the most useful. And then we have some of these sort of micro cotton bods. These are from um, Tamiya, I think. And then a mold line scraper from Citadel. This is another thing that came in that Conquest uh, subscription deal. I think you got it at the end of your first month or your second month or something. You got one of these. The ones you would buy retail would have a handle as well, but I find this to be completely useful um, on its own. And the other thing there that I really love is this. This is my standard hobby knife from um, Stanley. Little, just pulls out like this, the blade locks nicely into place. And you can hear it is locked firmly in there. It's not going anywhere. To release that, you need to pull out this little plastic stopper at the back, which has got quite a strong spring on it, so it's not something you would do accidentally too often. <laughs> pull that out, flip it around, and it's back in place. Uh, to replace the blade, you just unscrew here, and it just easily sort of clicks into place there. But very good. And I found this to be much easier to use, much easier to handle with, with really fine detail than the larger sort of Stanley knives or um, X-Acto knives. I just find this to be uh, really great. But this is from Stanley um, and very, very cool. A tip I've actually <laughs> discovered or I can share with you is that what, when I'm actually holding a mini here and I'm maybe shaving parts off of it, I found that Occasionally, my knife ends up sort of settling into the pad of my thumb here. So it just settles in just as I'm shaving the mini. And I've discovered that this actually leaves tiny abrasions across the thumb. And occasionally, if you, if you lose sort of grip on the mini, and you end up sort of bringing the knife into your thumb a little harder than you expected, you can draw blood and you can leave yourself feeling really, really tender here. Um, even after a few hours of of safe usage. So now before I do any sort of significant scratch building or modifying of minis, I put a plaster on this thumb. That is what I do. I put a, a big old band-aid right around here. Other brands of plaster are available uh, and it protects my thumb and it gives me a surface that I can use the knife against that's not going to damage me. There you go. Pro tip. Let's take the lid off and have a look at underneath. So I'll just leave that knife there so you get an idea of the bits and pieces that were inside. So here we go. We're into the, the main sort of heart of this. And this is the, the depth to give you an idea. So in here we've done, I have done, um, my normal setup, uh, my normal sort of loadout for going to a convention. We have our little bit of blue putty. This is a brand called Blue Tack. Others are available. And that just allows me to sometimes to, to secure a part of a model. Sometimes, like if I'm having trouble with sort of a pewter miniature, uh, a little tiny piece of this into the joint can secure it enough to allow the, the super glue to set properly. But also for, for different things. It's, it's, it's really handy stuff. In this little tub is some brush cleaner. This is the regular, sorry for reaching across, the Masters Brush Cleaner and Preservative, uh, one of the go-to brands for almost every painter I know. You know the stuff. I just scooped a bunch of it and put it in here. I found this is really great for making sure that I'm finishing off my day, cleaning my brushes. And do it right by them. Also in here, 
I think I got this in a Christmas cracker a few years ago. It's a little stand for a mobile phone. You can put your, set that down in front of you, uh, or a tablet, Let's see if I can find my phone. And you can just pop your phone on there. Oops, let's move that back a little. Pop your phone on there and watch a tutorial, YouTube video, you know, Spotify playing or something while you are hobbying. I just find it really useful. There you go. Uh, also in this, we've got uh, Vallejo's plastic putty, uh, great for filling in gaps. Gorilla Glue. So this is their brush and nozzle super glue. Um, as you can see, or as I showed you before in the other box is the normal plastic cement. But if there's something, say, um, if I'm working with metal or resin, or if I need to attach to a, an MDF base or something, this super glue is fantastic. I also have in the box here, this amazing super glue remover, highly recommended, especially if you have a little accent or something with the super glue, uh, great for, for getting rid of those excess bits and great for unsticking your fingers. Yeah, it happens. What else have we got in here? We have a customized Citadel grip for gripping onto your minis. You know the type. This is pre-customization and post-customization. Now, the problem I had was when it's like this, it is just too wide for the bento box. It just wouldn't close. So I dremeled off a section of it to allow it to fit because with these you can unscrew the top and I was able to have it fit in the bento box like this. Enough space and still enough grip. Uh, the only downside was that by trimming off so much of it I lost a lot of its weight uh, and it made it a little bit sort of unbalanced. So I, I glued in some coins and some ball bearings in the inside of it there and it gives it that uh, stability that I needed. So that's great. And then we have a set of tweezers there. My Xeron Micro Shear Clippers, simply the best clippers I've ever used. Um, these are just glorious. They're expensive compared to sort of standard sort of hobby clippers you would get, but they have a beautiful flat edge to them. Um, they really retain their, their, their sharpness as well. And they do a really nice thing that when you clip spruce, they, sorry for the focus there. So when you actually clip spruce with these, the pieces don't fly off around the room. Usually, Zeron have the ability of, there we go, so micro shear. Um, they are designed to sort of retain the clipped pieces. I don't know how they do that, but it is brilliant in use. And it stops you sort of chasing pieces of plastic around your living room or whatever. Uh, some silica gel in there just to keep it nice and dry. And then a little paint pot. So this was a, I think a, I think originally this was for icing cakes. Yeah, that's what it was. So I'm just peeling off the tape off camera here. So this was for icing cakes and you, it had like a nozzle on the top and you would fill it full of icing. And then you would kind of, you would squeeze it and the, the icing would come out through the nozzle. But I thought it would be brilliant as just a little water pot. So it folds down really tight like this. And then you just run tape, that tape around it to, to seal it or to, to keep it nice and shallow. Untape it, fold it out like this, pop water in there. And it's brilliant as a little portable water pot that you are very unlikely to, to drink out of accidentally. Um, and to give it some stability, I glued a a coin onto the bottom of it there. It just means it's, it's a bit more stable when it's on the table. Stable on the table. That's it. You have a full breakdown now of my normal travel kit. Everything I could possibly need for modeling, for modifying miniatures, for clipping stuff off sprues, for painting. You've even got a bunch of minis in there. Uh, and also those little things that you would forget, such as, you know, maintenance for brushes, stuff for accidental spillage to protect surfaces against that. Uh, and then, you know, these other sort of essentials like 
the goggles, the water bottle, and all of that fits neatly into a backpack. It's brilliant for being out and about with. I just, I don't know how I did without it before, and I think I just didn't. I had spillages, I had bags that were too big, I had, I forgot stuff. This way, um, I've been able to, to get all of my essentials with me. It's not expensive, for sure. Some of the individual tools, like maybe the Xeron cutters, would be a bit more expensive. You know, um, if you were to, to spend all of this in one day, you'd probably notice the hit in your pocket. But generally, we're not talking, you know, this, this thing here was maybe like a euro or two euro. Uh, the goggles, maybe 15. Um, the, even this Stanley knife, which is the best knife I've ever used, I think was only like six or seven, maybe pounds. And even when you get into, into brushes like these, um, my favorite brushes in the world, which are the, uh, the Raphael's, the 8404 series. Um, these are like six euro or something. And they last for yonks. These, these two in particular are, are, have been my go-to for well over a year. Uh, and look just like they did when I first bought them. Um, so, I mean, six or seven euro, you know. Not, not crazy money. So overall, not an expensive kit. There's also no fat in here. Everything ha it's lean as it can be. It's everything has purpose. Everything serves a function and I love it. And it's been transformative for me for getting out and about and doing my hobby wherever I want. And even if that's just going into the garden to sit and do some painting or whatever for a bit, Everything is right here that I need, which is amazing. But that's it. That is the, the rundown. Well, thank you so much for going on this journey through my travel kit. I really hope that it inspired you to, to do something similar, to, to free you up a little bit, or to compress the, the kit that you take with you when you go out and about. And if there is anything here where, you, where you're thinking, oh, I have a much better version of that, please let me know in the comments, you know, if it's a particular tool or maybe it's something I'm forgetting uh, that would make my life easier. By all means, add it into the comments as well, because I love seeing the comments there. I love having that conversation both here and in Facebook, also in Instagram as well. And please um, like and subscribe and, and click the bell there as well. That's pretty much it for now. All of the links to all of the things are down below. If you have any questions about any of these tools, where I got them, or anything like that at all, pop it into those comments too. Uh, next week on Grey Primer, we are going to be unboxing the monumental Northern Alliance Army box from Mantic for the Kings of War range. Uh, that is a huge set, and I can't wait to sort of share that with you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.